This is just as unexpected to me as it is to you. I come down, and I have to confess that I kind of played the part of a hypocrite. I come just a little bit late. I said, Brother Neville will be preaching when I get there, so he won't say a word to me. He'll go right ahead. When I come in the door, Billy said to me, he said, Brother Neville's already preaching. You're just in time. And I said, fine. Well, Ken, he said, I haven't started preaching yet. I just kind of wait. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe I could, uh, I know how it is to preach two or three times a day. It kind of wears you out. We know that. Yeah. Especially when they're young like we are, you know, yeah. young fellas. It, it uh, doesn't take long. So we're kind of together as brothers and we kind of hold our shoulders together. Yeah. And uh, our hearts together, our notions together. Yeah. So we can work together for the kingdom of God. And we like to be together with you. It's um, it's a grand thing. So I just asked the Lord to give me a little text or something to kind of get started off. Don't know what I'm going to say yet, but we just get started. And then wherever He leads us. It is true that we are. I was supposed to begin a six-day meeting in Fairbanks, Alaska, the 15th, beginning the 15th. But... Um, I don't think I'll be able to get up there at this time because I have a, another appointment I'm going to over in British Columbia. So I'm, I don't think I'll be able to get up this time. To, they want to organize a businessman's chapter, Christian businessman. I certainly solicit and desire your prayers for the oncoming meetings that we're trying to prepare for now. And... Uh, I had an invitation a few days ago of a, something that sounded good to me. And I don't know whether it's the Lord in it or not. I'll just have to wait and find out. <clears throat> a a businessman wanted me to come to Phoenix in January and go to every church one night all through the city of Phoenix and then have the convention afterwards. That sounded kind of interesting to me because it would give a an opportunity for me to get to speak to the churches and to all the ministers. Usually, the people think when, about me because I so rap against organizations that I'm against the man that's in the organization. I am not that by no means. <clears throat> I'm for the man. It's just like if I've seen a man coming down the river here in a boat, and that boat was full of Leaks, and I know it, and know that boat would never be able to go through the ripples down there. I'd be screaming and condemning that boat just as hard as I could, but not the man in the boat. Amen. I'm condemning the boat. I know the boat won't make it, and I know the organization won't make it, but I know the man in there will make it if you just step out. See? But it's like if you had an old car and was going up a mountain, and I know when you start down the other side, you had no brakes. I would be against the man I'm screaming against him. It's not him, it's the car that he's in. He's going to get hurt. And that's about the organizations. I think the people that holds on to those organizations as if it was God himself, and they leave off the Word of God just to hold the organization. Well, when they do that, I'm afraid they're going to make a vital mistake. Amen. And it's not that i got anything against the individual man, but it's the boat that he's riding in, you see. But I'm sure it won't make it. <laughs> the organization will never make it. But Christ will. Amen. So just step out of, the, out of the leaky boat of organizationism into the safe ship of Zion, the old ship that's never failed yet to land in time. Christ. And that's, thank you, would give me an opportunity to get to speak to those men. Now, I thought maybe tonight it's communion night and I hear they've had a baptism to go to have another. I like to come down for our communion. I missed it the last time not being here. I missed it. And I knew this was the first Sunday, so I made preparations to be here so I could be in communion for tonight. For I truly think that it's the duty of every Christian to take communion. The Bible said if you take this not, you have no part with it. And uh, I believe that it is uh, a showdown time for the Christians. If we do not take it, we have no part with Him, and if we take it unworthily, then we are guilty of the body and death of Christ. So it gets to a place where it keeps the Christian prayed up. And when it comes to communion, we should come.
come reverently, solemnly, sacredly, walking up, confessing all of our wrongs, praying one for the other. Not only that, but we should feel, if there's a brother or sister among us that we feel is just a little bit out of line somewhere, our hearts ought to be burdened for that person on communion night especially. To see them, if they'll be able to walk up and take communion and not be condemned with the world. Because they are our brothers and sisters. Now, for the last few weeks, two, three, two weeks, going on three, I haven't done very much speaking. I've just been resting. Or this is kind of a little rest season for me before the, the big push. Hearing Brother Neville speak of these predictions amongst the politicians and men who really have understanding of those things about an atomic war close at hand would last from December to January. Well, it just had this about right. They'd declare it and get it started and then a couple bombs and that would settle it. So the nation cannot survive an atomic war. We just could not do it. But uh, that doesn't alarm the Christian or it shouldn't alarm the Christian. We should be ready at any minute waiting for our Lord to come. And oh, many times, see, these, this is not tape. This is just here at home. There's no tape, so you don't have to watch what you're saying about going to someone else or so forth. It's just the home folks. i tell you what I've been doing. I've been going squirrel hunting. And, um, but I haven't been doing very good. There isn't too many squirrels. And I'm going to Alaska now, sheep hunting. And maybe some persons might, a lot of people, you can't say that on a tape or something because there's many people who don't believe in hunting at all. And, um, but I always notice if them that don't believe in hunting is bringing a piece of meat and they're very well satisfied with it. <laughs> and um, like a lady one time told me, and she said, Brother Branham, do you mean to tell me that, that you hunt rabbits? I said, yes, ma'am. Now, I'm not talking about the precious soul. She's gone on. And she said, oh, that's, Ridiculous! You shouldn't shoot those rabbits. So um, then, uh, wasn't well, the season was over? To the same lady said, "Would you bring me a couple of those rabbits?" He said, "They're the finest things I ever eat." I said, "Well, I guess that's what I call culture." See? And someone said, "What do you mean?" I said, "That lady has culture." I said, "Culture is someone who hasn't got nerve enough to kill a rabbit, but can eat it after someone else has killed it." So <laughs> That's what you call it, culture. Oh, I, um, I do not, I'm a conservationist. I do not believe in killing and wasting. I teach my boys, and who are hunting with me, never take nothing unless you're fixing to eat it. See? Leave it alone. Don't shoot a bird just for a target. See, that's not right. You got a target, set it up out there and shoot at it. If you're going to eat the game, then it was put here for that purpose. And to waste it, it's just like wasting anything else. It isn't right to do it. Shoot animals for for targets. And when I go into the mountains, friends, it isn't so much going up there for the go hunting. I'm going there to get alone with God. Some of if you'll notice my greatest experience I have is when I'm out hunting, when I meet God. Amen. Of all my experiences, I never had one like I had the other morning right up here going squirrel hunting. I've seen many things in my life signs and wonders and so forth. But that struck me stronger than anything that I've ever had yet. Just imagine now, just about the time of the break of day, rainy, solid, cloudy all over, and see standing in front of you, rising up from uh, like a cup sitting on a hill, sitting there, three rainbows rising higher and higher until you were so numb all over until you could hardly speak and walk close to it and hear him speak and confirm the very message that you're preaching to be the truth. Amen. So Jesus of the New Testament is Jehovah of the Old. He just changed his veil. Amen. Well, I, instead of studying that, I find out that same word where he changed his countenance in the Greek did mean changing his mask. Not exactly his veil, but his mask. It come to the place he was transformed, see? That means he changed his way. He was God Jehovah. And God Jehovah changed himself from a spirit and became a man. He's the same Jehovah God, which that was the Father, and this is the Son, being the same person. And how then he gave me something to speak. 
the Lord's willing, I aim to be at that same tree in the morning about daylight. And I'm, I hope he appears to me again. I, I trust that he will so that I can know what to do. I've got a burden on my heart for the people. As I see the hour approaching and know that people are not ready and a lot of my loved ones, I don't know what to do or say. And I'm going up to see what he'll tell me. So be in prayer for me. Then I leave tomorrow afternoon or Tuesday morning. A brother here in the church and I are leaving for uh, British Columbia. And um, I'm uh, going out with a, a group of Pentecostal ministers. It's a uh, sponsor the trip. It doesn't cost me one penny. And they sponsor the trip and got the guide. And the guide is a Pentecostal brother filled with the Holy Ghost. And then I've got some people to baptize in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, some trappers and, and things while I'm up there. Uh, Norwegian trappers and so forth that have, through these tapes that's went out, has seen the light, wants me to baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. And the head of the Ministerial Association of British Columbia, I'm um, to meet him next Saturday evening at the Pine Lodge at Dawson Creek, British Columbia, and he is hungering and thirsty to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> You see, it ain't no one because of honey and pain. Hallelujah. I want to baptize this guy, never preacher that goes with me this time, in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So you pray for me, you see. Which I know is true. It makes my heart hunger and thirst to see God. Now, before we approach the Word, and I won't take too much of your time, just teach a little bit out of some scripture so we can get a place to find where we can go to praying and getting, um, I believe somebody's standing in it. I, um, oh, pardon me, did somebody a little closer say it? I didn't hear just what the brother Dedicate his baby? Certainly, my brother. Yes, sir, bring your baby right up. Yeah, we'll be glad to do that. And now, I, I believe in this, now, so that I might explain it to the people before they come. Is Brother on in uh, Teddy? All right, if you'll come to the piano for us. Now, many people sprinkle these little babies. And they call it uh, infant baptism. Now, if your church does that, that, that's all right. But you see, if they do, it's an order of the church. It is not a scripture. The scripture does not support baptizing or sprinkling. The scripture does not support sprinkling in any manner. There's no one ever sprinkled in the Bible. There was everybody was baptized by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ. But now the babies in the Bible, they brought them up and dedicated them to the Lord. They brought little children and dedicated them to the Lord, gave them to the arms of the Lord Jesus. It's all right, sister, bring your little one on. And any other one got the little ones that wants them dedicated, well, we'd be glad to do that. Make it a dedication service for our little babies. Amen. Now, Jesus, in the Scripture, the, now, in this church here, we have mixed up organizations of all kinds. Some of them Protestants, some Catholic, and even have Jews that come in here. There's Orthodox Jews. That's the reason we strictly call ourselves interdenominational. And now, so that you would understand, we try at, at this church to be a scriptural church, just staying with the Bible. Wherever the Bible says anything, we follow that right exactly that way. Now, the first church, and all Christians and you ministers will admit that this is the history of the first church. We all know that. This is exactly what took place. I was speaking to a priest, a Catholic priest lives up here on the road recently, and he said, um, uh, Mr. Brandon said, are you a, a non-Catholic or a Protestant? I said, a Protestant. He said, uh, then you protest us. I said, no, sir. I do not protest, protest the people. It's the, the church, the doctrine of the church. He said, uh, are you, then do you call yourself Baptist or Presbyterian? I said, no, sir. Just a Christian. And he said, well, where do you form your form of doctrine? To be a Christian, you'll have to have a basic of form of doctrine. I said, that is true. I said, it's the Bible. Well, he said, that's the history of the Catholic Church. 
And I said, well, is that the apostles were Catholics? He said, yes, sir. I said, all right, I'm going to admit that that's right. He, I said, then why don't you also stay with the Scripture? He said, you see, Christ gave the church power to change the Scripture anytime they want to. Well, I said, then you've changed it and got it what you got it today. He said, yes, sir. I said, then I want to ask something. Then Christ must not be pleased with it. Because upon the first church, He poured out the Holy Ghost. They healed the sick and raised the dead and cast out devils and done great mighty miracles under the doctrine of the first Catholic Church. And it hasn't been seen in the Catholic Church since they changed the doctrine. Now let's go back and be original Catholic. Let's go back and be what the Bible says, what they were. Christ walked with those. That's the reason, friends, that we try not to condemn any church, any of the people in the churches, but we try to keep it just as the Bible says. Now, in the Bible, there never was a baby ever baptized. There never was a baby sprinkled anywhere in the Bible. But here's where it's in the Bible it said, They brought little children to Jesus that He might put His hands on them and bless them. And He said, Suffer little children to come unto Me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Now, that's exactly true. Now, therefore, we bring the little children and offer them up from the mother's arms of the father to our Heavenly Father and give them in dedication. And all deepness of sincerity, my children, I've got two yet that has never been baptized as yet because they've just been dedicated. i got a baby in glory that was just dedicated, not baptized, because baptism is for remission of sins. See, to show that you have repented, that baby has done nothing to repent for. It's a baby just born here in the world. It has no power with coming here. See, and it has no sins. When Christ died on the cross, He died to take away the sin of the world. Until this baby has done something to repent for, the blood of Jesus Christ makes an atonement. But now the mother and father, parents, has the right to bring their baby and offer back to God the baby that was given to them by God. Hannah in the temple. She promised she was barren. She was old. She had no children. She prayed so sincerely at the altar till the priest walked out and accused her of being drunk. She was screaming and crying at the altar for God to give her a baby. And she said, God, if you'll give me a baby, I'll bring it right back to this place and give it to you. Mothers, that's the way you got your baby. God gave you your baby. It's just as much as to give Hannah her baby. And now you're bringing your babies back tonight to the temple, just like Hannah did little Samuel, to the, and dedication service. Now we dedicate and give your baby back by prayer to the God who gave it to you. And I pray that these little boys and girls who are standing here tonight will be prophets and prophetess like Samuel was of old to the Lord Hallelujah. that you're giving them back. Now, if the audience will bow their heads just a moment. Most loving and gracious God, we approach thy throne of grace and mercy this hour for the generation that's coming after we are gone. These little fellows who stand in their holding, holding and holding tonight in their mother's arms and father's arms, they are the seed of tomorrow's race. To be sure that they get the right start, these mothers and fathers are bringing these little ones up here for dedication to give their little lives over to the living God. Father, the pastor and I will walk forward here and offer these children to you in a prayer of dedication. Bless them, our Father. We pray that you will bless them to be your little servants. May they live long, happy lives here on earth and see the coming of the Lord Jesus. Not only that, may they live a long, healthy, happy life and be servants of yours. May you lead them. May you make preachers, singers, evangelists, missionaries for tomorrow out of these children, if there is a tomorrow to come. Grant it, Lord. We will dedicate them to you the best that we know how, according to thy scripture that thou hast left us, the Holy Word, which is written in the last book of the Bible. God will take out of the book of life for that man who will take one word out of this or add one word to it. We realize then that the Bible is the sacred word of God and we cannot add one thing to it or take one thing from it. Therefore, Lord, we leave it just the way you give it to us and teach it and try to live it by your grace. As we dedicate these children as they brought them to Jesus in the days gone by, 
If he was here on earth tonight in a physical form, these mothers and fathers would rush up to his feet and bring them little ones. And he laid his hands upon them and blessed them. You are sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high tonight, Lord Jesus. And we are left here as your servant. We will lay our hands upon them in prayer to you that you will take their little lives and use it to your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask this. Amen.
for your service in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.
Until that time comes, Lord, we dedicate them to you. May you use their talents to your glory. Use their lives to live long, happy lives to serve you. We dedicate this little girl to you in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Oh, and may God be with you and ever bless you in everything you do. Oh, uh, I just think you're so cute. I, my uh, girls is getting to be big now, so I just kind of have to... I used to ride them piggyback, but make it almost give me piggyback now. They're so, so big. Becky especially. Great, big girl. Now, let us open up the word of the Lord unto Matthew's the 15th or the 5th chapter. And we will read just the potion, and then I will draw from this, the Lord willing, a little text for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll have the uh, communion and foot washing and baptismal service. It'll take us to about 9.30 then, or a little later, to get finished. I would like to begin from the 5th chapter at the 12th verse. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his Savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of man. Ye are the light of the world. A city that sets on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do man light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before man, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I would like to take a, a subject from that last uh, verse there, which is the 16th verse. Let your light so shine before man. Let your light so shine before man that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We find in the Scripture that uh, there's two places that Two different men speaking of justification. And um, one of them was Paul. And the other was Peter. St. Paul and St. Peter. And Paul was justifying Abraham by faith. And Peter was justifying him by works. Peter said that he was justified by his works. Paul said he was justified by his faith. Now, they did not contradict each other. They were looking at it in two different viewpoints. And Paul was speaking of Abraham's faith. That's what God saw in Abraham. And Peter was speaking of his works that spoke of his faith. So, it is written, show me your works without your faith, and I'll show you my works by my faith. Now, therefore, Paul seen what was talking of what God saw, and Peter was talking about what man saw, and because if a man has faith, he will act like it, his life will show it to others. Amen. So, I'm going to want to speak on that tonight, letting our light shine. Now, just for these few minutes, I just don't want to get up here to just to be seen or to be heard. That wouldn't be right. But maybe, God helping me, maybe we can speak some words to something that will be edifying to us, that will help us all. Uh, how that we could uh, do better and live a better life. I'm sure that's what we are all here for, is to take correction and to get an understanding of what we can do to make us better Christians. If I have one thing in my life that I desire is to be a better Christian than I am. And I'm sure that's the heart's cry of every soul that's here tonight, is to be a better Christian. Amen. 
Some time ago, I was going down a road and I driving along at a pretty rapid speed and watching as I usually do by myself driving. And it's a lonesome drive when you're driving by yourself. You can't turn the radio on unless you're some of these family networks where you can get religious music because it's all things that would take the very spirit out of you. And wherever I go, after I've gotten a little old, I, I carry a little pad of paper. And when the Lord reveals something to me, I just jot it down. And uh, I've even wrote on my gun stuff in the woods with a bullet and uh, things like that just to get a thought that is presented to me. Take a piece of tag out of my clothes or something and write on it. Something or another to keep the message in my mind. And as I drove along down this road, I noticed a great, big, beautiful signboard. And usually, you know, they have a lot of things plastered on these signboards, but I never noticed such things on this certain signboard. Usually they have pictures of, of half-dressed women or something other advertising a certain brand of cigarettes or, or whiskey or beer or something the great shining signboards. But to my surprise, at my first glance, it attracted my attention because it wasn't all smuttered up with something in it. The smut wasn't on. And I gazed back to see it was a beautiful board and sitting in a correct place just where when you turn this corner you can't keep from seeing the sign. And to my surprise, it had one word wrote across it. Hungry. Just hungry, that's all there was. Then I noticed a little bitty letters down at the bottom of the board said, three miles ahead. Hungry, three miles ahead. Well, I began to study about that. The people wasn't so much usually if they got a restaurant ahead, they, they're trying to outsell the other fella. The picture of big sizzling steaks and so forth, and when you go in, you usually don't find anything like to advertise. But it's just a, an advertisement. But this seemed to have a different approach. And we know that the day that we live in today, it pays to advertise. And uh, we find out that these people who are making such big progress in business are, are great men of advertising. They, they put it on television. They smear it on boards. Everywhere they can to advertise their products. Smoke this one, not a coffin, a car load, and the thinking man's filter and some other man's tip or something like that. Uh, but, and uh, the stay lively longer with their beer and all stuff like that. It's advertising. And they write off a lot of their income tax just for advertisement. And it certainly pays off. So if it pays off for that, I begin to think, then why won't Christianity pay off? If it's advertised. Amen. Well, I thought then, what, what is advertising? You've got to have something that is a little different from what the rest of them's got. Or if it's just so common like the things of the world, it'll never attract the attention of the people. Now, if a man would have been looking for an automobile, he would have went on past that sign. But if he'd been hungry, he'd been looking for that sign. So, I believe that the Christian is God's billboard. Amen. I believe that each one of us is God's billboard. And we don't have to do so much uh, carrying on about it as we do just simply live such a life that will make the people hungry to be like it. Hallelujah. Now, I noticed on this billboard, this certain one, it didn't claim any 
Nothing but just ask the question if you're hungry. And you cannot sell anybody anything to eat unless they are hungry. The first thing that advertisement does, the individual passing by has to see it. Now, the only way that the world will ever see Christ is when he, they see it in you and me. Amen. That's the only way they'll ever see Christ. Their, their conscience are numb to the sunsets, to the call of the birds, to the leaves and, and the grass and the flowers and the music and the message and so forth that we enjoy after we have found Christ. But until we get to a place that we display Christ. Now remember that. Each one of you from tonight on, remember you are God's billboards. And uh, you're, you're God's advertising agent. Now the world will look at you to see what Christ is. So we don't want to smear a big lot of stuff on there that's uh, testify about things that we really are not, let's first be that. Amen. And then when we be that, then the world will see Christ in you and me. The first thing that any advertisement, the person has to see it. Then the next thing, they have to want it. Now, if they see it and don't want it, then that's different. But you haven't put a vain advertisement out. But if they first have got to see it, and then we've got to make it so attractive to them. Amen. Well, I hope we see that. Hallelujah. The attractiveness of salvation. Amen. What it does to the person. We've got to attract the world. Amen. To Christ. And the gospel does have an attractiveness. It has it to those who are hungry for God. It only attracts those who are hungry and thirsty, and that's the ones we're out for. No man can come to me except my Father draws him. But there's so many that the Father has drawn and are hungry and thirsty to find God and don't know where to find Him. Because those who are supposed to be billboards is so smutted up with the things of the world until they can't see where they got any more than they got before they come to Him. They live like the world. They talk like the world. They sing the same songs the world does. They dress like the world. I mean, especially in the female sect. And uh, they act like the world. They go to the worldly places. They tend to worldly entertainments. Someone said to me the other day about a certain minister. And I love the man. There's no doubt the one he's a great man. He said, but he said that that you were a holy rover to me, that I was a holy rover. And I said, well, I, I, I don't think I am, but I said, uh, I, I want to be holy, and if the Lord ever told me to roll, I guess I would roll. But I, I want to be holy anyhow. Live a life of holiness means cleanness Amen. before God. And so he said, well, that you run out overseas and around like that and made yourself a missionary, no church sent you, and you just made yourself a handmade missionary. Well, I said, if I made a handmade missionary, it would never attract the attention of the world because that they're not looking for that. Amen. They're looking for Christ. And we find out that those men and people that think those things, there is two different classes. God has two different classes. There are men who God uses to stay home and marry the sick and bury the dead and kiss the babies and marry the young and so forth like that. Many of those men don't know what it is to pack a sword and get out there on a two-handed sword on the front line. They don't know what a battle is to fight against the enemy. They get out here and they're smart men, theologians, great men, who can stand with, um, put a sermon out that's just so touched up and also can talk with such language till uh, Webster would hardly know what they were saying. They got degrees in college. But that's all right. 
when you're talking to an intellectual group that's just looking for a church home. But when you get out there on the battlefront, where those men have more than that, they've got to see the power of Almighty God in manifestation, or you'll never sell it to them. They've got to see Christ in His resurrection. Yes, sir. Those men don't know what it is to hold a two-handed sword Amen. to fight toe-to-toe with the enemy there. Or devils and witch doctors Amen. and everything else standing there challenging you on every hand. Your men who read that Bible say, If Jesus Christ is the Amen. same yesterday and forever, let me see the Holy Spirit perform like it is out there. See? Oh, then you can't yeah. take a, a scholarship and do that. It takes the power and Amen. resurrection of Jesus Christ to produce oh, that. Yeah. Yes. And now that's what hungry navies look for. They've got to see it and they've got to want it. And that's the same thing this nation has got. That's the reason tonight that we got all these warnings of atomic war. It's because the nations have seen it, this nation has, and don't want it. Amen. And that's the reason that divine judgment is upon them. It's because that we are in within the balance. I see more our president, Mr. Uh, Kennedy, at the time I believe his name is, uh, Kennedy, that sat down for this, uh, so many uh, officers down for this uh, segregational war. He sat down 400 and something down in the south to stop this uh, segregational war. And when he ended up at his full course, he could say no more, he had exactly 666. He's in Times Magazine. Oh, if the people was only spiritual and could wake up and see what is 666. Exactly what they had. That's in this month's time. Now, we find out that until people begin to want God, until people begin to thirst, Jesus said, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now you've got to hunger and thirst for it. We are Christ's billboards and Christ is our sponsor. So this sponsorship is by Christ and He is giving us our life to sponsor Him. Now what kind of a person would you be if you sponsored somebody? What kind of a person ought we to be if we are, are sponsored by Christ? He gives us salvation. He gives us our healing. He gives us our health and strength. Amen. He gives us our food. Amen. He gives us our homes. Then we are sponsored by Christ. Amen. And Pentecostal people who still with the Holy Ghost is sponsors of Jesus Christ. They have been sponsored Amen. by Jesus Christ and given the Holy Ghost to be an example to the people. Amen. What are we to be today? Where should the church be today? We should be so in such a condition that would cause all the world to be want to be like us. Would cause man go down the street and say, There's a man I might disagree with him on his religious doctrine. But I'll tell you one thing, that is a genuine Christian. Or to be women going down the street and say, She may look old fashioned. She may not be like the rest of these women you see, but there's one Christian in this town, if there's one, there she goes. Amen. Because we are sponsored by Jesus Christ. Oh, what kind of a person would should we be if we are His billboards and we're sponsored by Him? Amen. Then in Christ is the one where we get our life and we get our strength and we get all that we have comes from Christ. He is our sponsor. Oh, I'm so thankful for that. So we must be like Him. Be careful what we do, what we say. What we do in our daily life. Because we are sponsored by Christ. How are we to walk if we're sponsored by Christ? What are we to say if we're sponsored by Christ? If someone says evil against us, what must we say if we're sponsored by Christ? We must be like Christ, isn't that right? Now, um, now there's only one thing that another thing we must do, not the only thing, but another thing that we ministers must do. We must preach a gospel that's appealing to the hungry. Amen. Now, if we preach a social gospel and say that, well, you ought to come join my denomination. We got 4,000 more last year in our organization. That's not it. 
Or if you come to my church or become a member of my church, we'll see that you're taken care of in the, uh, when you get old. And you'll be a faithful member and it's like an insurance policy. You'll be taken care of when you get old. We'll see to that. That still isn't the attraction. The thing that we want to do is to preach a gospel that appeals to a hungry world. Now how can you appeal to a hungry world that's wanting to see where they come from who they are and where they're going unless you preach the gospel that raises Christ up in a living atmosphere right here around us now. We cannot do it. There's no way we, we, could, jo- we could join the Masons, the, the odd fellows, any other lodge. Join some lodge would be just as well. But we're to preach a gospel that's appealing to hungry people. Amen. That'll catch those who are hungered and thirsting for righteousness. Blessed are they that are do hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled. Now, how would it be? The righteous shall be filled. Filled with what? Amen. The Holy Spirit. The Bible said Stephen was a man full. Full of what? Full of power. Hallelujah. Full of faith. Full of love. Full of the Holy Ghost. That's what made him what he was. Is because he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. He was a real advertising board for Christ. Hallelujah. We stood there that morning at the St. Hadrian courts Lord. and they accused him. They said, this man, what all he was doing. Hallelujah. And he stood alone, just him alone, out before the great St. Hadrian court. Maybe two or three thousand Jews or five thousand standing there with a pointed finger. The Bible said when he walked out there that his face looked like an angel. Amen. That doesn't mean he had a light shining from his face. An angel would be a messenger that knew what he was talking about. Stephen's walked out there not afraid of death. Amen. He wasn't afraid of nothing because he knew what he was talking about. Hallelujah. As Paul said, I know who I have to be. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him. But Stephen's walked out there before that St. Henry court like a sheep among a pack of wolves was howling for him his blood. And they accused him and pointed an accusing finger at him. What did he do? He said, man and brethren, God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was yet in Macedonia, before he was called out. Went ahead and brought down all the history of Abraham and how that through him would bring him the Gentiles. And when he got down to a certain place, look at him, full of the Holy Ghost. They waiting, just couldn't wait till they could get their hands on him. He said, you stiff necked uncircumcised the heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Ghost like your fathers did, so do you. Hallelujah. He was God's advertisement board. And when they stoned him to death, throwing him outside the city and beating him to death with stones, when he was dying, he raised his head to heaven and asked forgiveness for those who were stoning him. Hey, the same as Jesus did at the cross. Then God seen his little advertisement board being taken down. Stephen looked up to heaven and said, Behold, I see heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he fell asleep in the arms of God. He was an advertisement board for a hungry world. You say, well, how many was there? You said there maybe 5,000. How many of them got saved? There was one. He had accepted it right then, but years later. Oh, yeah. How was it up? Oh, yeah. Well, your influence never dies. Hallelujah. There was one help the cult. Saw that young uh, Pharisee stand there, consulted and give witness to his death. But when he saw that advertisement of the power of the red yeah. rise of Christ in that little fella, it never got away from him. That same man, Paul, that one standing there that morning, led tens of thousands of souls to Christ. Hallelujah. Because one man was willing to give his life to be an advertising board for Jesus Christ. What ought we to do today? No matter, we don't have to have big audiences. We don't have to preach to 10,000. We don't have to even preach. We can be God's advertisement board. How do you know that your life might not start some young man on the gospel, some of you older men, some you older women, start some young man on the field out there will win 10,000 souls to Christ. Amen. It's because that he saw Christ in you, that you presented Christ to him in the simple power of the gospel. Yes, I think we need uh, a Christ. Yes, sir. The only way we see Christ is when he reflects in each other. I see Christ in you. You see Him in me. That's how we watch Christ. I come to the meetings. I start preaching. I watch the people. You can see where they're interested or not. Just in a few minutes, you look over your audience. You can tell where you're bored or where you're not. See? And the first thing you know, you see Him sitting there, hanging on to every word, under expectations. 
See, I'm seeing Christ reflected in that person. Amen. Because he's hungering and thirsting for God. Then me preaching the gospel, he sees the Christ reflecting in me. Amen. I see the Christ reflecting Amen. in him. That means Christ is in our midst. Amen. 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 Hungering and thirsting. I watch the audience, how they take it. Say something other. Watch what, what effect it takes on them. Watch your face light up. Full of joy. They're ready right there to receive something. That's Christ. I see Christ reflecting in that person because the gospel, the simple gospel of Christ is taking a hold in that heart. Because they're hungering and thirsting. And I show a billboard here, an advertisement. What kind of advertisement? Not to some theology. Not to some man made creed. But to a Christ that lives just the same today. And he was back to her, for he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Right. They see that power of God move. Watch it over the buildings and see it pick out the people, discern their hearts, heal the sick, or reveal the secrets of their hearts, unstop the deaf ears to make the blind to see. Amen. What is it? It's a pity. Amen. It's a signboard. Uh, and the people see it and they rally and they praise God. I watch it in them when they're praising God. They watch it out here where it goes this way. So through each other, we see Christ reflect His life. Now, no matter how much I can reflect it here, unless it reflects on you too, we'll never understand it. The gospel will be of none effect unless somebody was there to take it. There will be many who won't take it. But the ones that will take it, it will reflect in them. There's maybe 5,000 that morning at the execution of Stephen. But there was one that reflected in him, even at the end of his life. He said, I'm not even worthy to be called one of the saints. He said, because I persecuted the church of God even to death. Uh, gives consent to the stoning of that martyr Stevens and never did get away from Paul. He said, I persecuted the church even to death. See, he never got away from because he seen Christ reflected. How did Stevens do it? He never performed any miracles. Although he knew that Christ was a miracle performer. He knew all these powers and things, but what did he do? He just presented his life in such a way that they see that it was the power of Christ. Amen. 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 You may never see a vision. You may never put your hands on the sick person and feel the charge of Almighty God make a skeleton of a man turn back to life again. You may never see him standing under three or four rainbows. You may never see his image. You may never hear his voice. But still you can be a symbol that will Jesus Christ by a life that's been so pure and unadulterated from the world. Not just up the dirty things around your life, but a pure thing that will cause the hungry heart, the hunger and thirst to be loved. Hallelujah. You're the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its Savior. Wherewith shall it be salted? That's right, hungered and thirsting. Let your light so shine before man that they may see your good works. See what you do and glorify the Father what's in heaven. Hungered, signboards, reflecting, wonderful. Yes, sir. Now, also, we don't want to do this. We don't want to make a quick sale out of it. You say, well, I got converted last night. Hallelujah, the whole world. You can't do that. That's a quick sale. If we do that, the product's not much good. If you just live good, say, well, I know one time, I, I lived good for two weeks after I was converted. I lived, two, I, lived, I lived two weeks just perfect life. That's a quick sale. That's like this Hattie call we just had. The other but a bunch of vitamins wrapped up together, and it didn't last for a little while. It finally went out. You want to be an everyday Christian, every Christian, every year Christian. Not a quick saint. But let your light so shine. If you walk up to a man and ask him to receive Christ, he lies in your face. Don't go and say, well, there's nothing to it, or he would have accepted it. No, that's a Hattie call sale. We're not selling Hattie call. We're selling the gospel. Amen. The power of the living God. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, if the world hated you, they hated Christ before they hated you. For well, the same call drove him to the cross. But we're his representatives. We're his billboards. We advertise him. You don't have to have a lot of fancy stuff, a lot of uh, Dr. PhD, LLD, the great sanctified church, and so and so and so and so, and found it way back, and so and so and so and so. We have so and so and so and so. Just make them hungry. Amen. Amen. A simple, clean, big Lord. Uh, Christ will across your life. That man will see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Praise That's it. Lord. Don't be smutted up with the trash of the world. Don't try to advertise yourself like 
Somebody said, well, I belong to so-and-so. This big church, it's the biggest church in the city. We got a person near our neighborhood up there that left a little church up here on the highway to go to a bigger church because it said a better class of people went there. A better class of people. See, they don't know their, their brain becomes dusty. Uh, it's it smells up with the things of the world. A better class of people. What is a good class of people? A people that's born of the Spirit of God. Amen. Because they're so poor they don't know where the next meal is coming from. That's the only class of people that's worth anything. They're the people that's born again. When Jesus comes, what the kind of a class of people did he have to get? Uneducated. Fishermen. Man, Peter, apostle, the great saint who was given the keys to the heaven, could not even sign his own name. Stumped with fish from the old fish boats and days of the old greasy apron on. Jesus took that type of a man. Today they're kicking out of church to be coming. Hallelujah. So where is it? See, the people are looking for class. And do you know the devil lives in class? Do you know what caused the first battle in heaven? Was when Lucifer set up a greater class of people. Got a better class of angels, he thought. Bigger, bigger kingdom, a more brighter, shinier kingdom than Michael had. And he was kicked out of heaven. See where class comes from? Stay away from class. Hallelujah. The hungry don't want class. The hungry wants food. Yes, sir. The poor wants fire. Not a picture of fire. And the hungry and thirsty for God wants the gospel and power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. No matter how sick it is, how how un, how unpopular it is with the world, they want reality. A man that's dying, a man that knows he's got to meet God, don't care about any class. He wants to find God. He wants to find Amen. assurance that when he comes yeah. down to the river, there'll be somebody there to meet him and show him the way. He wants something that anchors him now that know, I know my Redeemer liveth. Hallelujah. And the last day he's going to stay on the wall. I'm persuaded that there's nothing present that which is future or shall come. Hunger, perils, or anything else can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. Hallelujah. That's what they want. They want something, not a make-believe, something sell quick and get over here and join this church. I want something that... Say, well, I'll go down and join the church. I'll have a consecration service. The pastor will baptize me secretly and take me into the church. No, no. That's not it. That's one of them quick sales stuff. It won't last very long. I want real old passion conversion. Hallelujah. A man or a woman is willing to walk out and say, I'm wrong. I don't want to become like my neighbor. I don't want to be a woman like my neighbor. I want to be a man like my neighbor. I want to walk so godly before man that people think of me the same as they did of him. I want to be like Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I remember in closing, I, uh, I just keep on. But in closing, I want to say this. We're not his salesmen. We are his billboards. Hallelujah. Don't think we're his salesmen. You don't need any salesmanship. Just billboards. I used to work for the public service company. And we had this mobile lamp come out. They had a contest on it. Ever who sold the most lamps got a all prize and so forth and a certain percent they got for selling. Well, every person, every employee had to be a salesman for these lamps. Well, I got to thinking of something like this. If the product is guaranteed to me, the company guaranteed the lamp to me. Now, if that lamp's any good... It'll sell itself. And if it is no good, then I'm putting something over on the public that's not right. I never did believe in that. I don't believe in these high-pressure sales and stuff. That's the reason I don't believe it in religion. If I've got a product that's good, it'll sell itself. That's right, it'll sell itself. So, you know what I've done? I went down there and I said to the superintendent, I said, are these lamps absolutely guaranteed? Guaranteed, exactly. They will not turn, no sir. And they're guaranteed, the workmanship and everything is guaranteed, yes. I've seen they made a beautiful soft light. Any woman would appreciate them in the room. You know what I've done? I just loaded me up about 200 of them. And I started around to everybody I know. Said, what do you want this morning, Billy? Did I pay my bill? I had to collect bills. I said, no, oh, you paid your bill. I'll make you another one. I say, I got a lamp here. Oh, I can't afford it. Now, wait a minute. Just never asked you to buy it. I just got just a load of them. I, I want to unlock one in your house. 
You just keep it a couple of weeks and enjoy it, and I'll come back by and pick it up. We're supposed to advertise these things. Just take them out. So I just set it up in your house. Well, I, uh, Billy, I, I just couldn't buy it. I ain't got the money to buy it. Uh, didn't even ask you to buy it, did it? I just, I just want to set it in your house. Let you enjoy it. There's no kidding. Not a bit of hope. You know me. I'll come right by and pick it up. I'll pick it up again in two weeks. All right, I'll be right by and pick it up. The only thing I want you to do is just, I want to unload off my truck, get a place to set it. I've got to unload so many up here, I, I, I want to get it off my truck. I, I didn't want you to buy it. I didn't ask you to buy it. I just asked you to let you set here. Well, what if it breaks? That's my responsibility. I'm the one who stands behind it. I know the lamp would sell itself. I know it was a real product. I set the lamp in the house. I didn't take up 10 out of the 200. I won the contest because why? Why? The lamp sold itself. You want to see it and see what it is? Then you want it. It'll sell itself. That's the same thing. We don't have to have big organizations to sell Christ. We don't have to have highly educated preachers and high polished people that's mayors and you know, different things of the city. What we have to have is Christ. Amen. And Christ sells itself. You put Christ into a man's heart, you don't have to tell him you have to join this organization. That means he's already sold on the product. Uh, are you hungry? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. We're fixing to come to the communion table now for those who have never yet, uh, maybe have never taken Christ in your life. If you are a Christian, then you're hungry. I've been a Christian 31 years now. And each day I hunger more for Christ than I did when I saw Him. Amen. He gets sweeter as the days go by. And I watch his little billboards as I see him go down the street. Watch him out here in the hospital. Watch him in the hour of their death. Watch him out here when they're at a showdown. Watch that little lady, how she holds herself there as a real genuine saint. I stood at the counter here not long ago. Watch the little lady. Then he starts around and said, Do you know Jesus is your Savior? And the boy ducked his head down around the door. See, you know, yeah, there you are. Oh, she didn't know me, but I know her. <laughs> I know her. I watch her. She's married now. She's a married little preacher, and is just doing fine. So, that's it, you see. I like to watch that billboard. I like to watch it. It, 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 it makes me hungry to get to the place to where there, we can eat. It's spiritual food, because I know that girl just didn't belong to church. She was a Christian. That's right. Yeah, you can tell. The Bible said... Although Peter and John ate the heel that man at the gate called Beautiful, he was lame from his mother's wombs. He didn't have much strength. He couldn't stand up very long. Peter had to hold him up to get him to walk in. Healed from his mother's wombs. And when they took him in before the council and forbid them to preach in the name of Jesus, and they perceived that they were ignorant, the Bible said. These apostles, John and Peter, were ignorant and unlearned men. They didn't know any great theology. They were fishermen. Couldn't sign their name. But said they had to take notice to them that they had been with Jesus. Oh, glory. What were they? Billboards. Billboards. Oh, we could go on. God help us to be billboards. May this Branham Tabernacle here, this little place consecrated and dedicated to God, may it produce little billboards across this country here that will cause this whole hungering and thirsting nation to come to Christ and be my prayer. Let's bow our heads just a minute. Amen. Most gracious Father, we are indeed a privileged people to have Christ in our life and in our heart. We are so grateful for Him, our Father. We know that to know Him is life. Not to know the creeds, not to know the books, but to know Christ is life. And Father God, we who have found Him that way, our Savior, our Healer, our strength, our health, our help cometh from the Lord. We profess that we are nothing. We know nothing. There's only one thing that we know our desire to know. That's Christ and the power of His resurrection. For everyone that believes it has eternal life. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that You will bless this little church and these people here on this hot night, on this Sabbath evening here, sitting in this little wooden tabernacle, Waiting for the blessings of God. The few mixed up and broken up words that's been given. Hunger and a traveler see the billboard. God make us so hungry and thirsty that we'll watch for your billboards. See the Christian lives. May we be billboards for you. May you reflect your life 
to a hungry soul that they might hunger when they see the billboard that we are advertising. Christ, our sponsor, has given us a peaceful life a full joy and strength in our soul. And to live a life so that people would want to be like him. Grant it, Lord. Give it to all of us. And may there be some here who has not yet found that. But tonight they have been studying and looking along down through life's journey to the different old saints people. Those old mothers of days gone by. That man that they laughed at on the street corner and thought he was a, out of his mind standing out there preaching. But now they see that that man was a billboard. He was a sign that was pointing. That old sanctified mother that went down the street with her hair twisted on the back of her head, dressed old-fashioned, and yet we young people might have laughed at him and thought, what kind of an antique is that? But we realize, Lord, that was a billboard to eternal life. We passed it by, Father. We're sorry. We're sorry. Let us go back and retract it tonight, Father. Make us like that. Give us life. We want to look like saints before you. We want to act like him. That man that we spoke evil to, that man that we fussed at, he never said a word back, but it was very sweet. He said, that's all right, son. The Lord bless you. And we laughed in his face and walked away. Oh, God. Not knowing that that was a billboard. Not knowing that that man was a billboard that ever got eternal life to us. He had Christ in his eyes. Now we're hungry, Lord. We know where to go. We want to go to this place that the sign points us to, the Calvary, where we can find that kind of life, where a hungry soul can be satisfied. Yes, it isn't three miles down the road. It's just one step more. God, make that sinner tonight, make that one step come to Calvary. From the muck and sin that he's in, may he pull up close to Calvary just now and stop and look up and say, Lord, I've seen your sign and I'm hungry. Fill my hungry soul, grant it, Father. While we have our heads down, would there be some in here tonight that wants to pull up the side of Calvary and say, Lord, fill my hungry soul. Make me like a real Christian. The Christians of the Bible, the Christians that I see today that live for the Father. Would you like to be remembered? <laughs>
You care for the little ones. You care for the teenagers. You care for the old and the infirm. You care for the young mother and the young father. The old mother and the old father. For the little boy and the little girl. You care. You care for the uncared. Those who not being careful in life. Wasted our lives with lying spirit. We've done everything that's wrong. We're not worthy of your grace, Lord. But God, we're hungry. Brown with these others, Lord, stands to my children. My son and my daughter. I pray to you, Father, in the name of God. May some heart rejoice to stand here on the night before the Father's God. No, oh, he's kept me through these years. You see that? Said I'll be in the hour of temptation. So come to all the world. You care for us, Lord. Other little girls and boys are nailed around here. Mother's hearts and father's hearts are with Johnson. Maybe some mother and father hear that their loved ones have been gone for years. Go for any mother and go away. She looks over the banish to the night of glory, down to the corners of heaven. She sees that daughter, that son, needing a daughter. You care of her, it shows you here. Now, the little message of being hungry, they hunger, Lord. You reflected your life in them. They come up here tonight to be charged or made a sign for for you. Give them a sunbeam light, Lord, in their heart. Forgive every sin. Grant it, Lord. They're yours. They're trophies of the message tonight. Offered to the great Christ that died in the heart. May they come, Lord. You said, whatever you ask, believe that you receive what you ask for, and you shall receive. I ask for salvation for every soul that's now in this hall. I ask, Lord, that there be a sign for us from this night on, that in their life, their everyday life, will reflect Jesus Christ, from the youngest to the oldest. That they'll never forget this night, never forget the song, He cares for you. And when they're hungry and thirsty, He cares enough to feed their lost soul. You forgive their sins. For it is written, He that will hear my word and believe on him that sent me as a life of mine. He that will come to me, I will know I have passed out. Then regardless, Lord, of the condition of their soul, when they walked up here tonight and knelt down this altar, they came to you, Lord. It is possible for you not to receive them. For your word to not fail. I will in no wise He that comes to me, I will give him eternal life. And will raise him up at the last day. Here they are, Lord. Taking eternal life right now because you said they would have. Eternal life. God's own life in them. And they would not come into the judgment, but the atomic bond of the flesh, they'd be gone before the flesh. They'd have eternal life and be raised up at the last day. Transformed, transfigured, taken out of this world in the glory. They are yours, Lord. I present them to you as signboards along life's journey. May the little girls be a signboard in the school. The little boy is a signboard in the school. Papa and Mama a signboard in the shop, at the work, in the house. Make them all your sign for they are yours. As your servant, Lord, I give them to you in the name of Jesus.
We know he said it. Now, Father, we pray that you'll prepare our hearts in tenderness and repentance. Yes. That we who come may not be condemned with the world. May we come as Christians. While we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. While their ushers or the uh, deacons are coming to the table of the Lord, we're going to sing to him, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. While we make ready for the communion just in a moment. And the uh, ushers will come forth of the deacons and bring the communion table while we're singing this. There is a Yeah, 
representing the body of Jesus Christ, this kosher bread. He take bread and break it. He gave to his disciples and said, take, take ye and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. O Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life and giver of every good gift, look down upon the sons of man and forgive our sins as we in penance bow before thee. Unworthy creatures we are. And when we see the price that God paid for our sins by sending His Son, made in likeness of sinful flesh, and His precious body, I see the nail scars in His hands, in His feet, the thorn marks in His head, the pierce under His precious heart. This was all done for my sins and the sins of my people. This, Lord, we repent of our sins. This bread represents that broken body which we are to take in remembrance of Him. O oh, Father God, sanctify this kosher bread for that purpose. We ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. In like manner, he took the cup, and when he stopped saying, This is the blood of the New Testament. This do in remembrance of me, for as often as you drink it, you show forth the Lord's death till he comes. Almighty God, Creator of heavens and earth and author of good life, the eternal life, the only life. Father God, we give to you this fruit of the vine, which we remember in your great, sacred, precious heart. As you, that night, knew that you were leaving your loved ones, you called them aside and took the supper and said to them, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine. So I pray it with you and you in my Father's kingdom. We are looking forward to that. Day that when we shall drink this with you and you in the kingdom of God. That great and noble night that shall come. When the wedding supper will spread across the skies. We shall stand there redeemed by the blood that this grapes represent. O oh God, sanctify this kosher wine to its intended purpose to represent the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may everyone that partakes of this bread and wine, may they receive divine strength, help, heal their sickness, forgive their sins, Lord. Heal my sickness and forgive my sins. Amen. And make us thy people, thy servants. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Supper being ended, the devil now hath put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he had come from God and went to God, he rises from the supper and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. After he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he unto Simon Peter. And Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answering said unto him, What I do now thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, he that is washed need not save to wash his feet. But ye are clean every whit. Ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garment, and sat down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. 
If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. To the newcomer that might be in the tabernacle, this has been our custom since I've been a minister here and shall be until days my days shall be no more. It is customary that after feet washing, we after communion, we observe feet washing. I think it's an order from the Lord. The women go to one room and they wash each other's feet. As an example, there was only three things that Jesus left for us to do. One, that was natural. One of them was water baptism, the other in communion, and the other was feet washing. All other things such as touching, and handling, and so forth was omitted at the cross. But these things were commanded to be observed. And we find that 33 years after this, Paul preaching or telling Timothy that even a widow that was under 60 years old could not be taken into the group of believers unless she had lodged strangers, had prayed constantly day and night, and had washed the feet of the saints, showing that feet washing was still observed after that many years. We have record of it down through the ages. We still observe it here. It's the old-fashioned way of the Bible that we do it just because that it's a commission. It's a commandment from the Lord that we should do these things until He comes again, showing forth that we believe in Him, that He did it, and He said here, I have given you an example that you should do to each other as I have done unto you. Happy are ye if you know these things and do them. Amen. So it is a, our belief in the Bible that we should observe after communion feet washing. I think immediately following that is a baptismal service. I know it's a little late, but remember... You see, our boss asked us to work a little overtime or something. What about the worship of the Lord? Many times they preached all night in the Bible's time. I remember one time in the Bible, a reading where Paul preaching all night. A young fellow fell out of the window and got killed. Paul went in this lady's body over the young man's body and life come back into him again as he lived. And it's still the same gospel, the Pauline gospel that we still preach, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now, the women have a room back here and the man has room here. And now, if you could stay and could want to see the baptism service, and you're going to be baptized, we have clothes here ready for baptism service, which will be immediately following this, which will take about maybe eight or ten minutes to finish the, ba- the foot wash service. And if you people, men or women, who have never observed this, and you want a blessing in your soul, knowing that you are doing it, just when you put the towel around yourself to kneel down to your brother's feet, to wash the feet, just remember that Jesus put a towel around himself one day and knelt down to wash fishermen's feet. And he said, I give you an example that you should do to one another as I've done to you. Just keep that in your mind, and I'm sure there's a blessing ahead for you. God bless you now. Let the women go to that room, and if you just want to stay for baptismal service, just remain in your seat. The baptismal service will be following this service right here. And the man will come back here, and the women will go back there. God bless you. Thank you.